is Pastor James Maddox. I am filling in today. For those of you who are Viking fans, yes, I'm from Green Bay. So, I'm not a real Silas fan, though. Happy to be here and to lead you in worship. Um, the children will now step forward and sing the first four verses and join us for the fifth verse as indicated in your worship folder. God bless our worship today.
Did they do a great job or what? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, children, for enhancing our worship this morning. Please stand, everybody. We'll continue with morning praise at the bottom of page 45. Oh, Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O oh God. The Lord is risen. Let us worship him. sin is crouching at the door. It has a strong desire for you, but you must rule over it. Cain said to Abel, his brother, let's go into the field. When they were in the field, Cain attacked Abel, his brother, and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the soil. Now you are cursed and sent away from the soil, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the soil, it will no longer give its strength to you. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is too great for me to bear. Look, today you have driven me away from the soil. I will be hidden from your face, and I will be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. And whoever finds me will kill me. The Lord said to him, No. If anyone kills Cain, he will face sevenfold revenge. And the Lord appointed a sign for Cain, so that anyone who found him would not strike him down. Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Here ends the first lesson. We continue with the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 66, page 9.
Today's second lesson comes from 1 John chapter 3. This is the message you have heard from the beginning. Love one another. Do not be like Cain, who belonged to the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own works were evil, while those of his brother were righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, if the world hates you. You know that we have crossed over from death to life because we love our brothers. The one who does not love remains in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life remaining in him. This is how we have come to know love. Jesus laid down his life for us. And we should also lay down our lives for our brothers. Whoever has worldly wealth and sees his brother in need but closes his heart against him, how can God's love remain in him? Dear children, let us love not only with word or with our tongue, but also in action and truth. Here ends the second lesson we read together the seasonal response. The Lord is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. Death has swallowed up in victory. Alleluia. Please stand. The Gospel lesson is found in John's Gospel, chapter 14. If you love me, hold on to my commands. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another counselor to be with you forever. He is the spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it does not see him or know him. You know him because he stays with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I am coming to you. In a little while the world will see me no longer, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in the Father, and you in me, and I in you. The one who has my commands and holds on to them is the one who loves me. The one who loves me will be loved by my Father. I too will love him and show myself to him. Here ends the gospel lesson for today. You may be seated for hymn number 396.
I would like to begin by saying thank you to Pastor Nelson for giving me this opportunity to proclaim God's word to God's people. And I, of course, do not come to you in my own name, but in the name of the living God, and alive and well God is, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. If you're like me, you don't mind hearing an occasional feel-good story. The ones that I have in mind, I checked this past week, you can still find it on a YouTube video. The setting was a girls' softball tournament, championship game. In this video, a gal at the plate appears to have hit the winning home run. And she's rounding first base, begins to limp, and then down on the ground she crashed with a torn ACL in her knee, and there she lay, between first and second. Now the rules state that she herself must touch each base for the run to count, and that her teammates may not help her. The opposing players huddled, and they made a decision. They went to her side, and they lifted her up off of the ground and carried her to second base, which she touched. Carried the third, touched it, and brought her home. The run counted, but those who helped lost the game, but they helped the hurting. And it always feels good, does it not? If I might share with you for a moment what it is the ministry I'm connected to does, Christian Family Solutions, one time called Wisconsin Lutheran Child and Family Service. And to insert your bulletin and highlight some of the things that we do. For nearly 60 years, this ministry has existed for no other reason than to help the hurting. The way in which we help the most hurting people is through a professional Christian counseling. We have over 130 counselors, all with master's level degrees. Ten of them are doctors operating out of any one of over 50 clinics in seven states. And if they are not helping some hurting person who drives to the clinic to get the help that they need, the clinician is in front of his or her laptop using technology that has become familiar to so many of us, Zoom, offering face-to-face -face counseling help to somebody literally somewhere in the world. Currently over 800 Wells congregations have partnered with us so that the hurting members in their midst can get counseling help when they need it. All of our Lutheran high schools, our prep schools, our colleges, world missions, Friends of China, Kingdom Workers, they've all partnered with us so that the hurting members and their organization, their ministry, can get the counseling help when they need it. In the year before COVID, in that one year, our counselors conducted over 40,000 hours of counseling. In the midst of COVID, over 90,000 hours of counseling in one year. A lot of hurting people. Maybe you're one of those people, maybe you know somebody who needs this kind of help. What is it we are helping people with? You name it, we see it. Anything from anxiety to depression, marital problems, problems with children, problems with parents, problems with loss, grief, loneliness, isolation, post-traumatic stress disorder, substance abuse, and the list goes on and on and on. Hurting people that need help. I appreciate this opportunity to share this ministry with you and hopefully you take interest in it as well. But it's one thing to take interest in and support a ministry that has expertise that the average person does not possess. But when you stop and think about it, helping the hurting is not only for professionals. It's for all of us. In the parable of the Good Samaritan that I'm gonna talk about for a while this morning, Jesus leaves no doubt in our minds as to what his expectation is for you and for me as we live out our life until he takes us home to heaven. 
wants us not only to be concerned about those who are hurting, to feel bad about their situation, but he wants us to do that which is in our power to actually alleviate their suffering. And we'll be reminded this morning that God himself gives to you and to me both the power and the desire to help hurting people because he has made you and me part of the best feel-good story there ever will be. My guess is that you already are familiar with the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's important to, to know the setting of this parable. <clears throat> it appears as if Jesus is preaching to a crowd of people and suddenly one stands up and interrupts him. He's called an expert in the law. What's an expert in the law? Among other things, he knew the Bible fairly well. I personally think he's kind of full of himself. But try to picture it. Stands up, interrupts Jesus. He says, tell me, teacher, what do I have to do to get to heaven? Jesus kind of turns it right back on the guy. And he says, well, basically, you're, you're the expert. How about if you tell me? What does the Bible say? And the expert recites the Bible passage quite well. He says, well, the Bible says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. The response Jesus gives to that first might sound like false doctrine, but of course it's not. He basically says, buddy, you do that, and you're in. What Jesus is getting at is that this guy was capable of loving God perfectly and loving his neighbor perfectly, that he would not be among the imperfect who are in need of a Savior. He'd be able to get to heaven with his own effort. But of course, like us, he was a sinner. That was impossible for him, and he had that to learn. I think one of his issues is like a lot of issues people have still today. I think he had what I call a ladder climbing approach to getting into God's heaven. What I mean by that is this, one rung of his ladder, the good things he tried to do, the next rung of his ladder, the bad things he tried to avoid. He kept on climbing, he kept on striving. He assumed in his own head that when he got to the top rung of the ladder, that's the day of his death. He find himself in front of heaven's door, the door would swing open, and he would go. It's not how it works, though, is it? Left to himself without a savior, his ladder is leaning against the wrong wall, and he had that to learn. I think he started to doubt his own thinking because he comes back at Jesus, and he says, yeah, but tell me, who is really my neighbor anyway? Again, I, I think he was like a lot of people still are today. Tight circle of friends, neighbors. He had decided in his own head who he allowed into his inner circle. People that looked like him, acted like him, as educated as he was, as affluent as he was, those are the people he allowed into his inner circle. If they were hurting, he would feel an obligation to help them. But the people outside of his circle, the people who were there, they weren't really his neighbors, his friends. And if they're hurting, too bad. So Jesus teaches a classic parable. A man is traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho and suddenly his day goes south. He's jumped by some robbers to take everything he has, nearly his life, and leave on the side of the road to die. Two guys, one at a time, come by. They see this poor guy lying there. I picture them kind of shaking their head and looking really sad. But they end up tiptoeing around him and going on with their day. Why? Because they had more important things to do. And these guys should have known better. They're the church-going types, a priest and a Levite. And then you have somebody coming by his donkey that you would never expect to stop any steps. It's a Samaritan. Samaritans and Jews did not get along at all back then. But he sees this poor guy lying there, and his heart goes out to him. He's got to do something. So he jumps down from his donkey, does his best to bandage him up, puts him on his own donkey, walks him into town, checks him into the urgent care facility of their day, 
stays with him through the night. In the morning, he has to be on his way, so he gives some cash to the innkeeper. He says, I will be back. If it costs more than this, we'll settle when I get back. That's the end of the story. And then you have Jesus asking a question of the expert in the law. Who acted like a neighbor to the man who fell among robbers? The expert answers, it's the one who showed him mercy. Yeah, Jesus says, now you, go and do the same thing and forget about the little circle of yours. As I mentioned before, he had a ladder climbing approach to getting into God's heaven, but without faith in the Savior, his ladder is leaning against the wrong wall. He was an expert, all right, really going places. It just so happens at this point in his life, without faith in the Savior, one of those places was not heaven. It might be a good time in this sermon for you and for me to ask ourselves the question, how does our effort at climbing that ladder look? How has it looked in the past? I mean, if we're really honest, would you agree with me that there are days from our past that we would just as soon forget? If only we could forget, right? Days we're not very proud of. Times when we withheld love from somebody. Times when we withheld forgiveness from somebody. Times when we acted as if the world revolved around us. Times when our Bibles remain unread and our prayers unsaid. Times when we weren't too excited about coming to God's house. Times we allowed unwholesome thoughts to rattle around in our brain, assuming for a moment they're private, but of course they're never private to God. And I'm sure that on more than one occasion, you, you and I have had somebody in our life who's really hurting. We felt really bad about their situation. We knew we should do something, but, yeah, you guessed it. We ended up tiptoeing around them, didn't we? And going on with our day, because we had more important things to do. And we're the church-going types. Left to ourselves, our ladder is also leaning against the wrong wall, wouldn't you agree? But, God so loved the world that he actually did something about it. Think about it. A lot of people can talk a good game when it comes to love or merely have loving thoughts, but loving activity takes it to a whole other level. God in his love took action. And the action that he took was the giving of his dearest treasure, the person of his son who took on human flesh like you and I have. And then as the perfect holy son of God, he waded through the sinful murky swamp of humanity, but he maintained his holiness in the process that is of vital importance to you and me, and this is why. Because God promises that when you and I believe that his son is our savior, get this, God chooses to take the perfection of his son, the holiness of Jesus, and he credits it to us. The Bible says God clothes us in his son's righteousness. And as a result, God's face shines down upon us with love, approval, acceptance, and even admiration. That's a God you and I don't have to be afraid of. Not today, not tomorrow, and not on the day we die. Talk about a feel-good story, and by God's grace, we are a part of that story, and that's only the half of it. Because not only did God's Son live a life of perfection on our behalf, he then eagerly and willingly went to the cross, suffering all the blame and shame for everybody's last sin, in the process winning for you and for me the forgiveness of all of our sins. And as a result, God promises to take us for a real, endless, perfect, joy-filled, custom-made heaven. And he has his family back together again. Talk about a feel-good story, and it's real, and by God's grace, you and I are a part of that story. You might have noticed, 
We're not in heaven yet, are we? There are chapters in our story yet to be written, and in the parable of the Good Samaritan, Jesus reminds you and me of what he's looking for in the final chapters of our story. And my guess is that everybody in church here this morning knows somebody who is hurting, somebody who would benefit from our help, our assistance, our care, and our love in response to all of the wonderful assistance, care, and love that God has brought into your life and mine. We see hurting people in our ministry every single day of the week, including Sundays. A number of years ago, I was a guest preacher down in one of our Florida congregations. This was pre-COVID. As I introduce this story, it's important to realize that everything we do is confidential. I'm not a counselor and I have no idea of who's getting counseling or for what. Just so happens that after the fact, I found out that there was a mom in the congregation that day, that day with her teenage daughter and we had been counseling the teenage daughter. When I was done with the service, I was greeting people at the back of the church. The mom and her daughter came through the line, and mom shook my hand, and with the other hand, she slipped me a note that she had written during the service. I opened the note later, and it read, Thank you. I have my daughter back, and she's also back with the Lord. Help for the hurting. I still have that note. A number of years ago, I was a guest speaker at a convention on the West Coast. When I was done, a gentleman from the audience who I had never met introduced himself to me. And once again, I had no way of knowing that, in fact, we had been counseling him. He approached me, introduced himself to me, and he said, Pastor Maddox, can we speak privately sometime today? And I said, certainly. We sat down together later in the day and he shared his story. He said, I am married, I have children, I'm the chairman of our congregation, I'm the lay delegate to this convention, and ever since I can remember, I have struggled with same-sex attraction. Thank you. Thank you so much. I'm now able to manage this burden in a way that is pleasing to my Lord. Help for the hurting. When I compare the expert in the law in this account of the man dying in the road, if in my own mind I could make the man dying in the road alive, I would choose to I would choose to believe that the man that was dying in the road was in better condition. Because we know for a fact that the expert in the law was still dead spiritually in his transgressions and in his sins. He was hurting and he didn't know it or he didn't know why. Which leads me to one final story I'd like to share with you. In one of the congregations that I served in my ministry, there was a member, a young lady, perhaps at the time in her mid-30s, so faithful, worship, Bible class, service, you name it, a real joy. But something about church made her extremely sad. It was her husband. And I'll give to him, it's not his real name, but I'll give to him for the story's sake, the name Dave. Dave would have nothing to do with church. He was a devout atheist. She talked to me on occasion about her concern for Dave. He traveled a lot with his work and she knew that if something happened to him, he would be lost eternally. On one occasion when I visited them at their house, Dave nearly laughed me out of the house. Yeah. But a half a year or so after that, to my shock, he began to show up in church with his wife. He made it kind of obvious though that he was not a real willing participant, but he was there. A few months after that, he showed up unannounced at my office, and after some small talk, he got to his point. He said, Pastor Maddox, that thing you guys hand out at church, I don't even know what you call it anyway, a bulletin or something? He said, yeah, that works. He said, well, 
in there it says you've got some kind of an information class starting up. Bible information class. I think I might want to take that in. Whoa. Totally shocked. He was a very busy guy. His schedule was not at all compatible with the day and time of the class, so he took Dave through the class one-on-one. -on -one. And in this case, it was kind of a long class, um, 20 weeks, a good hour every week taking a look at what God had to say about everything. When we were done, I said to him, Dave, what do you think? I don't know. I don't know. Could I take the class again? Okay. So we started all over again. We ended up going nearly a year. And when we were done, at least I assumed we were done, I asked him again. I said, Dave, what do you think? And I'll never forget his answer. He said, I'm just thankful I did not die. Click, click, the light of faith had come on. He now knew he needed a Savior and had one in God's Son. I pursued it further with him. I said, Dave, in the class we talked about the power of the Word of God. You know, the Holy Spirit uses the Word of God to give a person faith and then, and then to sustain and grow that faith over time. In your case, and tell me if I'm wrong, I'm wrong. It just seems to me that something else happened before. It helped you to turn the corner and start thinking about investigating God a little bit. Am I right? And if so, you know, what was it? And he thought for a moment. He said, yeah, yeah, you're right. What was it? The crazy members of your church. That's what he said. Of course, I asked him to explain what he meant by that. He said, they were crazy nice. Crazy nice. And he went on. He said, Pastor Maddox, do you remember what a jerk I was when I first came to church? I went on to say, oh yeah, I do. But we didn't go there. That's not how they treated me, though, he said. They seemed sincerely happy that I was there. They invited me to come back. They would break away from conversations they were having with people they knew real well to try to strike one up with me. Some guys even asked me to go golfing with them. What was that all about? They were crazy nice. And I didn't get it. But I think I get it now. See, Dave was an expert. Vice President of an international corporation. He was really going places, but until Jesus found him, one of those places was not heaven. But now that Jesus had found him, he was heaven bound. My guess is that everybody here in church today knows somebody like a Dave. Maybe they're an expert, maybe they just think they are, doesn't matter. If they are without Jesus in their life in a serious way, they are either hurting and don't know it, or they're hurting and they don't know why. Is that person in your life your opportunity to build a bridge of kindness and helpfulness toward that hurting person so that in God's good time they just might notice what you're doing, turn and come walking back towards you over the bridge you built in order to find out what makes you the way you are? You and I are part of the best feel-good story there ever will be. There are chapters in our story yet to be written. And those chapters include examples of us being good Samaritans, helping the hurting. Amen. You may remain seated. We continue with the next hymn, hymn number 562.
We continue on page 15. In the morning, O Lord, I call to you, be merciful to me and hear my prayer. Every good and perfect gift comes from you. Inspire us to think those things that are true and long for those things that are good, that we may always make our petitions according to your gracious will. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And Lord Jesus, we pray you for your amazing, unchanging truths revealed in the Bible, your perfect law and your gracious fulfillment of the law, suffering, death, and resurrection from the dead for our salvation. We thank you for churches and schools where fellow Christians walk with us as we grow in your grace and teach it to the next generation. We also thank you that neighbors are finding peace in the clarity of Christian values we teach in our schools. Enable us to provide enough teachers to meet the needs of our students, and may your Holy Spirit lead families to trust in you through your gospel and word and sacrament. Amen. And dear Lord, we also pray for Pastor Jason Baldwin, who has been called by this congregation. He serves currently in St. Charles, Michigan. We ask, dear Lord, to, to bless Pastor Baldwin, to give him wisdom, guide and direct him, that he may do what is pleasing in your sight as he struggles with now two calls to serve in your kingdom. We ask that you would receive our prayer of thanks for the opportunity to call, and we ask for success, dear Lord, according to your will. And we also pray together the prayer that your Son taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, you have brought us safely to this new day. Defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. You may be seated for our closing hymn 343.
Good morning. Once again, welcome. 